Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cicciadini, for inviting me again uh, to Palermo, a beautiful place, beautiful, great food, and great friends. Uh, my task is both not so easy to, uh, to touch clinical status and new research, so it goes uh, uh, two things. I will try uh, uh, to touch both areas. So fertility preservation indications, uh, it's not only cancer, as previously said, it's uh, patients who are treated with chemotherapy or radiotherapy, cancer patients and not cancer patients indications, gynecological patients, operation or disease by itself can cause uh, damage to the ovary, and things that cause problems with the biological clock age-related accelerated loss, but also genetic thing, uh, situation like in Turner syndrome where the biological clock is accelerated and we, uh, the patient is losing her uh, follicle reserve very fast and the other situation that will cause changes in uh, the biological clock. Fertility uh, preservation difference from conventional infertility work and the points for consideration is the need, has been uh, discussed previously, what are the indications, the problem of the timing, but this point I will touch more deeply in my presentation is the health status of the patients. We are doing invasive techniques and we need to take care first that the patient is health is uh, okay and she can have her treatment the, which is the most important thing for her. And we treat unique age groups, the children, or what's going with the advanced age, age. And patients that were recently exposed to chemotherapy and to toxic agents or are going to surgery. And then we must ask, what is the efficacy of our techniques? And we have different technologies and the safety issue. So the options for fertility preservation in cancer patients are the invasive technique and the protective agents. So when we talk to cancer patients, uh, we have to know the probability of premature ovarian failure, and this is an example of a bone marrow transplantation with high, very high risk of ovarian function loss, even for children and for adults, but there is the ovarian injury. Survivor have diminished ovarian reserve, and you can see it uh, for, uh, for children with the decline of uh, AMH, with, uh, depending on the treatment the patient receives and uh, the age group, and also with the FSH and antral follicle count, which uh, uh, differs from those who were exposed to treatment and those who are not. Also, has been uh, very nicely shown by, by Richard, uh, that a chemotherapy effect is not all or none. Repeated cycle increase the damage, and this is important for fertility preservation planning. You can see here AMH levels with uh, repeated uh, cycles as it uh, goes uh, down. It's not exactly as with the ovarian reserve, but in animal study we show very similar that with repeated cycles, the total number of primordial follicles uh, declines cycle by cycle. So when we go to our patients, we have to consult them and to say, should you go for fertility preservation uh, treatment, yes or no? So we have two things in mind. First, what is the ovarian reserve, and this is determined by the age, or if they received, and cancer patients, it's quite often, if they received previous cancer uh, treatment, which makes their ovarian reserve smaller, and what is the toxicity risk of the medication they are going to have, like pelvic irradiation, alkylating agents, of course, these are the most toxic, but also platinum derivatives, and also we can tell them there is no risk to you. For example, if they will receive anti-metabolites, the ovarian reserve will not significantly be decreased. So you can tell the, the parents, the patients, you, you'll be okay. And this is very reassuring and very important. So it's individual consultation, individual assessment. And then when we see the indication, we have to ask, is it possible? 
and this is the point uh, I would like to, to stress. Patients' general condition, sometimes our patient, and I talk now about the cancer patients, suffer from certain situation that will prevent us to perform fertility preservation at this point, like thrombocytopenia, severe anemia, you can replace, but sometimes it's difficult. Mass, mediastinal mass especially. Two days ago, just before arriving on Thursday, I had a patient from another hospital with huge mass of Hodgkin lymphoma. With the heart was very much to the, to the left, and the, and the blood vessel was almost obliterated to a three millimeter, the superior vena cava. And why not to go for ovarian stimulation and egg collection? And this patient can die at this point. So no, you should not go for fertility preservation at this point. And our other organs like the brain, spine, and large bones, the risk of anesthesia, can they go for an anesthesia? Cancer patients might suffer from hypercoagulable states. In addition to estrogen, they can get clotting problem. And the contamination of cancer cells and ovarian metastasis should also take into consideration. We also look at our, the ovaries of our patients. So all these are come into cons uh, consideration. And then comes the recommendation for fertility preservation. And here I argue with uh, other centers uh, is there really risk cutoff that uh, yes or not to perform fertility preservation? So if the, the cutoff is, uh, the risk is 20%, shouldn't we do fertility preservation? Because maybe this patient will be a survival and she will be on, in this 20%. So why not to offer her fertility preservation? Is it a center decision or patient's or family decision? The patient general condition we discussed before, the delay of cancer treatment is something also that comes into consideration. And the last point, and I will emphasize it because we do it a lot, can we start chemotherapy and postpone the fertility preservation technique? And yes, we can. So the option of the fertility preservation are the invasive techniques, which are egg freezing, embryo freezing, or ovarian tissue or the protective agents. And it is vital before we use a protective agent like the GnRH analog that was mentioned before, we have, must understand how it works to develop better understanding of the mechanism by which chemotherapy destroys the follicle population and then we can find a way to protect it. When we start the fertility preservation, we don't do the same. By freezing e eggs or by freezing embryos, we use the mature oocyte in this cycle, or the almost mature for the IVM. By freezing ovarian tissue, the population that is preserved are the primordial follicle population, and this makes the whole difference, and I will try to explain. So with the oocyte freezing, and this is theoretical uh, list, you can see that we need a certain number of eggs in order to have the good probability of a live birth, and this is from the human reproduction from last year, but this is theoretical. And with cancer patients, we don't get these numbers, but you, you see that you need quite a few eggs in order to have a real chance of a baby. And the question of the timing is answered very well in the literature, and we as others use this protocol. We can start with uh, luteal or random star stimulation for our seed retrieval, and it works. You can uh, get similar number of eggs or embryo by starting uh, the fertility preservation for egg or embryo freezing and the random start or luteal, although I must admit that we prefer the luteal. Can we collect oocytes following chemotherapy? Why should we do this? So one, I explained before, patients when they are come to you are too sick. You cannot make IVF and you cannot make laparoscopy at this stage. So you should start chemotherapy immediately. Sometimes the oncologist must start like in leukemia. They start it even in the emergency room, they start the treatment. And sometimes they switch from treatment to treatment. The first one, uh, treatment was not so toxic, and the second, like high-dose chemotherapy is toxic. So we have the patients that are coming, or we in, in purpose send them 
after administration of chemotherapy. So I, I will not show all the works that we have done on this, but we do not collect mature or immature eggs for fertility preservation in patients recently exposed to chemotherapy. And this is for the all time peri period of time that the, the follicles are growing. And we have shown it in animals uh, that you, you have a high malformation and al high abortion rate, more than 30% major malformation. And recently, our PhD student showed it. When you look at DNA damage, you can see sublethal damage, very high percentage in eggs that were recently during growth exposed to chemotherapy. So this is not an option. Nevertheless, ovarian tissue freezing at acetacin, yes, you can. You can start, and I will show it, chemotherapy and make the ovarian tissue freezing after initiation of chemotherapy. So there was the, the publication of, uh, of uh, Donez and the Belgium group, and our publication came after, and we had the advantage of doing all staged in one place. We uh, collected the tissue, we monitored the, the menopausal situation of the patient for many years, we made a transplantation with the endocrine evaluation, we made the IVH, IF, and we also monitored the pregnancy, and this happens with all our patients. It's one shop that we do all things, so we have the de denominator. We know what is the success rate of this procedure, in our hands. But in order to practice, you have to show two things, the efficacy and the safety. The efficacy is the patient's characteristic, characteristic, how do you prepare the tissue, what is the operative technique, how do you monitor, and do you use infertility treatment, and also uh, the safety. So, the procedure is simple, but it uh, involves many steps which are very important to reach a success. And I will touch only a few of them. Some of them were, were discussed by, uh, by Professor Donnet, like the transplantation side, the vascular bed. But I will t uh, talk about two points, about the preparation of the tissue, about the operative technique as we do it, and about follicle activation, which seems to be a very important issue in transplantation. So let's start with the follicle activation after transplantation. When we harvest the tissue, let's say it was 100% of follicles, by freezing, you don't lose many follicles. You lose up to 20, maximum 30% of the follicle by freezing thawing. But after transplantation, you lose a lot of follicles. And this can be by ischemia, but what we have shown by, uh, by, by two works, and now under preparation is the third one, that what happens because you don't have inhibition, follicles in the graft start to grow, and actually a follicle that starts to grow, you lose it. And if we can prevent this growth, you can have a larger reservoir of follicle within the graft. So the follicle activation is one, is a major factor that involves loss of follicle after transplantation. Is it good to have this growth? So you have the publication by the group of uh, Kawamura and Shui that say, okay, take small fragments of ovarian tissue and put it, and then you can uh, restore uh, ovulation in POI uh, patients, not for fertility preservation. Uh, Klaus uh, Anderson and myself wrote uh, an opinion letter in human reproduction showing that, on the contrary, we want to have th this tissue that will be kept and then brought into the patients so it can serve the patients for many years and not having them burn out and losing them. So this is uh, the idea, and you can change it by the size of tissue you prepare for freezing or for transplantation. The smaller the size, the higher you will have activation and growth and burnout. So the size that was presented by 
Sherman Silber, Jacques Donnet, Klaus Anderson, and ourselves, that the size of tissue matters. And if you take very, very small fragments of ovarian tissue, you'll get this kind of burnout and you are going to lose follicle instead of having them and have long survival of the graft. What about transplantation results? I think that they are really underestimated. So this is the technique that we performed. You have seen the way that uh, Jacques Donnet performs transplantation of ovarian tissue. Well, he is much better surgeon than, than us, uh, than myself. And we need to make it simple. Everyone should be able to transplant ovarian tissue. And uh, I will show you the way we, we do it. And we, we, you, it can be done by laparoscopically. It can be done uh, by it's really very short, but you see, you make a tunnel below the cortex, you put the slice in, you close, you put su two sutures from both sides, finished operation. It's very easy, it's very short. We have done all our transplantation in this side. The eggs know how to go. It's either, you can get natural pregnancy very easily, by this technique. So this is the difference between uh, the two procedures. Both of them work very well, but the operation is really much easier. And then, in many of our patients, we do IVF, and you can see here stimulation of a fragment of a, a transplanted ovarian tissue, and you can see the endometrium. And what protocol we use, it depends on the reservoir of this patient, on the endocrine parameters when she gets the cycle. And sometimes we go for the natural modified cycle, or sometimes when the hormone profile is very good, we'll go for conventional stimulation, as in this case. So what are the results? And we published it uh, uh, two years ago, but uh, we revised some, some of the results. And you can see here that uh, I would like to show only a few points that conception rates is 56, 56 up to 60% conception rate, and we get IVF pregnancies as well as spontaneous pregnancies. Sorry, I go to the wrong direction. But these are important things. First, the age effect. You can uh, transplant ovarian tissue and get pregnancy at older patients. You don't, should not limit yourself to 35 years old, although the success rate is lower. We had a, a patient, even twin pregnancy with a delivery in the patient at the age of 37. So our age limit is not 35, is up to 40. We've, and we know the success rate is lower. But look here, we in purpose take patients that started chemotherapy and then perform the ovarian tissue freezing either because of health condition or in order to avoid cancer cells in the ovary, which I'll show soon, soon. But the results are very similar. We have 60% pregnancies in the group of patients previously exposed to chemotherapy recently. And this means that we do it much safer and with a very good success rate. And also you can see here spontaneous pregnancies as well as IVF pregnancies. And the advantage is not only that you get the pregnancy. We had patients that conceived again and again and again, either by IVF or naturally. And this is our record, a woman that conceived four times after single transplantation of ovarian tissue. There is no way that, it, that with, by one cycle of egg freezing, you get four pregnancies. And also, you have to remember the endocrine profile and the prolonged fertility and the repeated pregnancies. Actually, this patient is now under oral contraceptive. So ovarian tissue freezing for fertility preservation has high pregnancy rate. Natural or IV has as the potential of repeated live births, and it restores endocrine function for a long period. What about safety? So we have published a few years ago, together with uh, uh, Jacques Donnez, a roadmap on leukemia, because leukemia is the highest risk of having cancer cells in the ovarian tissue. And you can see that what we do in purpose, we start chemotherapy, 
And only when the bone marrow is clear and the patient is in remission, for example, like before going to bone marrow transplantation, that's the time when we go for ovarian uh, tissue freezing. And the other thing is that at Shiba we opened a special clinic that actually serves many countries, not only ourselves, that the clinic, a uh, laboratory, sorry, not a clinic, that th this lab offers how to look for cancer cells and its individual treatment, and according to the disease of the patient, we monitor to see if we can find minimal residual disease, small number of cancer cells in the ovary, and sometimes first we have the tumor of the patient, and we find the marker, and with this marker, we go to the ovary and look for this marker, and we do histology, and we do fish, and we have the myeloid uh, panel with many, many genes showing for, uh, for example, for AML, and we put the ovarian tissue into skid mice, and only after having all this, we were able to transplant ovarian tissue into leukemia patient, and this was the, the first delivery of leukemia survival uh, after cure preservation of ovarian tissue, and I think it is imp important and why it's important? Because this is the population that needs ovarian tissue freezing the most. The leukemia patients that go for bone marrow transplantation, these are our patients, this is our population, and we should uh, try until we have other options to grow follicles. Uh, this is clinically available. This patient, you can see her here with the baby, delivered, and actually two months ago she delivered her second child after a single transplantation, and we have another woman coming actually from Milano that is now pregnant in her third uh, trimester of pregnancy after AML. So the situation in Israel, and I think we are unique in this, the Ministry of Health decided to run tissue transplantation and uh, cure preservation transplantation are no longer experimental. We don't need uh, ethical approval. Well, we do the best medicine we can, uh, but this, the patient comes with, uh, and the government pays for everything. And those are the people in our uh, laboratory, and many people are involved in the Fertility uh, Preservation Center at Chiba Medical. Thank you very much.